Hi again, everyone. I'm Jim George, IOPP Director of Education, and welcome to today's webinar. At IOPP, we do a webinar just about every month, and today's very special presentation is a joint effort of IOPP and the Contract Packaging Association. So welcome uh, today as well to our attendees from the CPA. So as we begin, I want to take a quick moment wearing my IOPP hat to acknowledge the companies you see on your screen. They are IOPP's benefactors and their support goes a long way toward making IOPP's education programs, including this webinar and all of our webinars, possible. So we thank them for their continued support and I hope you'll have the opportunity to support them too. So as I mentioned a bit ago, today's presentation is a partnership between the Contract Packaging Association and IOPP, and it's a little bit different than, than uh, our IOPP members on the line are used to seeing. Today we have a panel discussion on trends in contract packaging and also where and how contract packagers can help you. So I'm going to get out of the way now and introduce you to our panel moderator, Vicki Smitley. Vicki is Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Hearthside Foods Solutions a leading North American contract manufacturing and packaging company that offers solutions to consumer packaged goods companies that work in the food packaging space. Vicki has been with Hearthside Foods Solutions for more than 20 years, doing both business on a national and global front. In addition, Vicki has been involved in various contract packaging association activities and committees since 2001 and she currently serves as the association's president. So I'm going to turn things over to Vicki, uh, adding just a quick note here that we will be taking audience questions uh, during the panel discussion. So we're going to have our chat function off and you'll have an opportunity to ask your question. There's a little questions box on your screen that you'll be able to type uh, questions into the question field. And we'll get to as many of them as time allows near the end of the hour. So Vicki, I think I'll turn things over to you now to say a few words about the Contract Packaging Association and then introduce our panelists and then lead our panel discussion. All right. Well, thank you, Jim and IOPP, for the invitation to talk to you today about trends driving changes in the supply chain. This is a very hot topic these days. And before I get into this, I do want to mention that if you're looking for more content and conversation on this topic, you may want to consider attending the upcoming CPA annual meeting. It is happening next month, and we will have a panel of industry experts uh, discussing just this topic. Um, and on your screen, uh, you see uh, Jill Gabbard's picture. She's the person to chat with. There's her phone number listed. Or you can get more information about the annual meeting coming up uh, at our website at uh, www.contractpackaging.org. So um, before I introduce our panel, I'd like to set the stage by providing our audience with a very brief overview of the Contract Packaging Association and the industry as we see it. The Contract Packaging Association is a national nonprofit association for contract packagers and contract manufacturers, as well as the many suppliers to these companies. The association was founded in 1992, so we're very excited to be celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. The CPA is run by member company volunteers, just like myself, and the rest of the board of directors and committee members, along with CPA staff. And Kelling Company is our association management firm and has been our management partner for about 15 years now. Today, our association is about 200 member companies strong and growing rapidly. We believe in building a better supply chain. It is through education, networking, and industry exposure that we help members innovate and grow their businesses. Essentially, this is the key reason for the CPA existence, to serve our members. 
Okay, on the screen you have in front of you a few facts and figures. And these were extracted from the 2014 industry report, which is published by the Contract Packaging Association. The industry report is published every three years. And the 2017 industry report is well underway today and will be available later this year for sale. So you want to look for that. Um, again, um, if anyone has any interest in this, Jill is also the point person for more information around the timing of that publication. Our members manufacture or package a huge variation of products. From the glamorous to the hazardous, we often say. 65% of our member companies manufacture packaged food products, but we also have members that package personal care, even auto parts, and some other markets that are listed here on your screen as well. So why do companies outsource their products, you might be wondering. We've compiled a list of the most common reasons. The nimble nature of contract manufacturers generally equates to a lower overall cost solution and a faster path to market. After all, speed is critical to a product success. And we'll be talking a lot about speed, speed to market, or rather speed to consumer here in a few minutes. Um, to touch on this last bullet, Today, many brand donors are choosing to partner with contract packagers to be their operating arm so they can focus exclusively on the sales and marketing of their brands. Many in the industry predict this trend will only increase in the coming years. So let's get into it. Um, our on our panel today, we have representatives from three CPA member companies that will speak to some key emerging trends. As I introduce each, feature, each speaker, I'd like to ask that they give a brief overview of their company. First up today, um, Rob Reinder is the CEO of Performance Packaging from Las Vegas, Nevada. Rob, would you please um, introduce your company? We may have some connectivity problems um, with Rob, um, so we're going to move on. And also joining us today is Mike Rep. Mike is a Vice President and General Manager of Bell Carter Packaging, and Mike's business is based in Modesto, California. Mike, can you give us a brief overview of Bell Carter Packaging? You bet. Thank you, Vicki. Um, Bell Carter Packaging, uh, we're, headquarters are here in Modesto, California. Uh, we focus on being a total end-to-end -end resource for our customers, uh, providing services for warehousing, production, and fulfillment. And we, we do that all from three locations here in the western U.S., um, Northern California, Phoenix, Arizona, and Portland, Oregon. 85% uh, of our business is related to both primary and secondary food packaging, with the, uh, the other 25% focused on promotional packaging and non-food product lines. Uh, we are very focused on quality and carry strong certifications from SQF, AIB, we have organic, gluten-free, kosher, uh, and a number more. Uh, we have 250 professional and well-trained employees, and it's great to be on the call today, Vicki. Well, thanks for joining us, Mike. Um, look forward to um, the next few minutes coming up and chatting with you on this important topic. Um, Last but not least, we have Jason Sam. Um, I'm hoping Jason has uh, successfully dialed in to join us today. Jason is the CEO of Newology Corporation, and he, hopefully he will be joining us from Toronto um, this afternoon. Jason, are you on the line? Okay, I'm being told that we have some technical difficulties with a couple of our panelists. So we're going to go ahead and get started, and um, Mike has some very interesting perspectives on all of the trends that we're going to talk about today. We'll hope that our other panelists get dialed in here soon, but until then, we're going to carry on. Sounds good. Okay. 
Okay. All right, so to ground us on the screen is a graphic depicting the traditional supply chain. Um, and when I think of a historical game changer in this traditional supply chain, my mind immediately goes to the first moving assembly line. In 1913, this invention made it possible for Henry Ford to build cars in two and a half hours instead of 12 hours. This was the creation of mass production as we know it. And this innovation, in effect, drove out considerable costs, so much so that it became possible for just anyone to own a car, not just the elite. So change, or rather sea change, is the focus of our discussion today. The first trend we want to discuss today is the change in consumer buying habits. I personally one-click everything from cat food to birthday gifts, and these things seem to magically appear at my doorstep in no time. So, uh, Mike, I will start with you, and uh, as others join in on the line, as soon as I get noticed that they're on and our problems are resolved, we'll let the others join in. But until then, you're it. Contract packagers tend to be very entrepreneurial and resourceful. How has the Internet of Things and the changing consumer buying habits influenced your business? What can you share with us? You know, Vicki, um, one of the things that uh, has definitely changed for us, we've, we've become very focused in the last five years on becoming a, a total resource. And by a total resource, uh, I mean where we've uh, moved ourselves into the position where we are the procurement arm, we're the warehousing arm, we're the production arm, and we're providing the fulfillment uh, back to our customers. And I think as part of that, right, we've, we've had to become very adaptive um, to shorter runs and more items being run every day and handled uh, in our operations uh, to make us effective and, and service our customers. Um, we've definitely, like, you're, uh, like you had for the uh, key changes in the industry. Uh, we've definitely become more flexible in our operations. Uh, we've become extremely flexible in our planning. And one of the main things that we've done is we've really gone after the e-commerce side uh, of the business, where we have set up the operations to, to handle pick and packs, you know, customization basically being driven at individual, uh, individuals. Um, and we're use, utilizing systems like Shopify, Magento, and all coordinating with uh, ShipStation to make sure that we are handling all of our customers' orders, you know, basically uh, same day, next day turns uh, for customization of orders. And uh, we've really had to work ourselves. We were, we were not used to that, but uh, we have definitely become change agents in and adapting to the trends. I definitely agree with what you're saying there, Mike, as well. This is Jason here. Hi, Jason. Thanks for joining. Um, would you give us just a brief overview of Neology for the audience as we roll into this today, please? Sure. And um, I guess this is maybe it's a good segue because um, Mike was uh, uh, speaking about the technologies that uh, are certainly enabling um, this, this economy, this, this me economy. And uh, at Newlogy, I'm the CEO. Uh, what we do at Newlogy is we connect brands to their strategic suppliers. That means co-packers and co-manufacturers and 3PLs um, to uh, reduce costs, um, increase quality, and to grow their business uh, to higher quality, more customized products. Um, most of our, our business is in food and beverage cosmetics and pharmaceuticals, also some electronics. Um, our technology is, uh, is a SaaS or cloud-based solution offered in over six languages and um, uh, we have uh, offices around the world and, and um, are live in, uh, in six continents serving some of the largest brands and, and their suppliers to, uh, to make this, uh, to make products uh, better and higher quality and, and at lower cost through the automation of what we call the uh, digitization of the, uh, of the customization supply chain. Fantastic. Well, thank you for that. 
Um, I understand that Rob is available on the line as well. Hopefully you can hear me now. I can hear you now. Rob, CEO of Performance Packaging, uh, would you please give us a brief overview of your company? Sure. Thank you, Vicki, and uh, apologize for the uh, connection troubles to all out there. Uh, performance Packaging has uh, been in the flexible packaging business for 21 years now, and uh, we saw the trend for contract manufacturing growing probably nine or ten years ago, which led us to join the Contract Packaging Association, and it's been one of the best moves that we've done for our company. We're able to integrate with uh, the various contract manufacturers out there and help them with their, their packaging solutions uh, along with their customers. Fantastic. So, so Rob, I'll ask you, I'm not sure if you heard the question earlier, um, and we were talking about contract packagers being very entrepreneurial and resourceful, and wondering if you can share with us a little bit about how the Internet of Things and the change in consumer buying habits has influenced your business. Well, I think, um, you know, Mike hit it on the head, and, and his obviously his business model is, uh, has been geared and ramped up towards that. Um, similar situation for us. Um, we're very familiar with Amazon, and really, what what Amazon has done is they've changed the uh, the playing field. And uh, now, um, it's no longer the big guys that uh, create and distribute products anymore. But uh, it's allowed entrepreneurs of all sizes to be able to get involved into the retail climate. So with that, you know, there there then becomes. Uh, there's a much broader customer base to go after, but it's also a much smaller size company that you're going after. So the runs are smaller, and you just have to, to be uh, working on lean manufacturing and cutting out as many things as you can in the process to be nimble enough to, to handle this, this new technology. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it certainly sounds like your companies are keeping pace with the change, but in general, a sea change really is here and now. It's, it's upon us. Is it your opinion that the overall manufacturing world is ready for the Internet of Things? Jason, I would ask uh, that you respond first, and then we'll turn it over to Rob and Mike in that order. Yes, yeah, so the, um, the Internet of Things obviously suggests uh, uh, this, this digitization um, and uh, the expectation to be able to connect various entities within the supply chain, and in this case, uh, as we talked about, Amazon and, and other, um, uh, they've, they've really raised the expectation on the consumer side, which, uh, which means that uh, consumers, you and I, uh, are, are able to um, get access to and expect access to more varied product um, delivered in much more uh, uh, diverse channels. Um, and potentially even obviously direct to me. Um, I, I think that uh, with the confluence of, of the acceptance of, of cloud um, and uh, um, the, the automation that's, that's occurring within um, uh, the supply chain uh, to automate processes, and certainly the, the whole pull toward that's created by uh, the consumer and uh, then is, is being Put on the on the retailers to give a varied uh, amount of um, a broader spectrum of products and a uh, broader uh, set of offerings to be able to uh, uh, order those products um, mm -hmm. means that this um, uh, we have to be ready um, for um, to be able to go direct to consumer and and to connect closer to that consumer where the brands are now a, a, it's really a brand of brands. And uh, each of those brands need to speak to um, different demographics, different segments of the economy, and, and um, different channels. So um, that's what I would say. Rob, anything to add there on that one? Yeah, you know, I would say we're, we're getting there, particularly in the flexible packaging industry. Now you've seen the development of uh, digital print uh, technologies to be able to, to keep up with the uh, the small runs and and uh, the the short order lead times that have, that have uh, fallen with this new technology and with the new Internet of Things, so it's it's definitely 
happening in, in our end of the of, of the supply chain, um, and it's also happening in in the co-man uh, areas where they're having to gear up for their smaller runs, be more efficient, more nimble, and uh, like Mike said with his company, be able to uh, deliver individual products. Um, so that that's what I see. Okay, thank you, Rob. Mike, would you like to add on? Sure. I, th I think the uh, exactly what Rob was talking about the you know deliver individual products. I think our industry, the contract packaging industry, uh, is at the forefront in kind of leading leading the charge because the fact that we are used to being nimble and being creative in supporting customers' needs for products to market. Um, I, I think we've had a lot of training, <laughs> to say the word of how to help customers turn things fast. And uh, I think the, the internet continues to drive things faster, and our friends at Amazon continue to do that. So uh, from a contract packaging standpoint, I, I think we're actually in a leadership role in uh, helping to address this in the industry. Interesting. OK, well, thank you. So the job of a contract packager has always been to help our customers remain and stay relevant and competitive. Um, given this omni-channel revolution, is it more difficult today to deliver a competitive end product? I'll start with you again, Mike, and then we'll move to Rob and Jason. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's a good point, Vicky. It it definitely uh, in the beginning was definitely a challenge um, in making the change um, to be able to to react to be more nimble. And I think um, you know as we've done things right, it's the more value we can add to support a customer from the standpoint of um, what are people willing to pay for as a convenience to have things immediately. And I think that's where our systems, uh, our people are adapting to those changes to make it more effective. And our goal, right, is to be able to put our customers in a position where their focus is on sales and marketing their brands. And we're the, we, are, we are the entire back end arm of their operation of getting that product into their hands, into the customer's hands. Rob? Rob, on helping your customers remain uh, relative and competitive, um, is it your opinion that uh, that's a little bit more difficult or challenging today um, than it has been in the past? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, we've we've also noticed that the uh, end use customers, um, in, in our case being the brands, um, they they want to deal with somebody that, like Mike said, can do as much for them and be able to go to one person for as much product and as much of the back end supply chain that they can. So that led us to go into dry food uh, contract manufacturing and liquid food contract manufacturing so, so we could be more of a one-stop shop for our customers to not only be doing the flexible packaging but then also the contract packaging services. And I, I believe that's a trend you'll continue to see grow. Very good. So what I'm hearing, and, and Jason, I think you can speak to this, we're talking about the, the customer, the CPG, you know, really having the sales and the marketing end of it, have an operations arm here. Uh, and as you alluded to earlier in conversation, there's this connectivity that has to happen in the background in real time to be able to make all of this come together successfully and ex you know execute um, accurately and, and on time, which is important. Can you speak to those to that for for a moment? I think um, you and I've had some you know conversations around that in the past, and I think this would be good for this audience. Yeah, Vicky. I, uh, I think more and more. Um, the only sustainable advantage um, is, is speed, um, and, and speed to launch, launch a product, uh, speed to offer a new service. Um, so as we talk of the macro uh, trend um, around this 
differentiation uh, of, 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 of products um, and, and different channels, that uh, variability um, is really that the enemy of, of, of mass you know, production. So if um, you want to, uh, I, I think it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity for uh, strategic you know, leading uh, uh, manufacturers and cold packers uh, like Bell Carter and, and performance packaging to find a niche um, and, and offer a go-to-market that's uh, rapid and, and, and that, that, that gives the, the ability in, not, in a very entrepreneurial way for uh, a brand to do what they do best, which is, is branding, um, and, but to launch that product through whatever channel that makes sense for that type of product. Um, and uh, you know, technology is, is, that, is that wonderful um, foundation for, for doing that. Um, so choosing uh, which technologies make sense and tying them together to offer speed to market for brands vis-a-vis -vis, uh, strategic uh, co-packers and co-manufacturers, um, I think is, uh, is, is a growing trend. And uh, I hear it's, it's difficult because there's so many options you can go into. Um, uh, dry food blending, do you want to do uh, um, primary or secondary packaging? Do you want to do both? Um, and there's so many different things. And, and the fact is you probably can't do everything. <laughs> because it's, So choosing what makes sense um, uh, is very important. And, that, and that's difficult. Well, thank you. Um, you know, that's certainly um, very helpful in this conversation. Uh, you led in with variability in production. And uh, our next slide will, will be, that was a good lead in for our next uh, slide here. If I can figure out how to get to the next slide. OK, thank you. There we go. Oh. That's two slides. Now we want one. There we go. Right here. All right. All right. Let's talk about customization. Chosen by me for me. So today I can order my groceries online or, you know, via my laptop, my telephone, and I can have them ready to be picked up curbside when I arrive, or I can ask for those to be delivered to my house. I can have my sodas or my candies with my face or my name on them if I want. And if I want to have a box of customized healthy snacks or a ready-to-prepare meal delivered to my house, I can have that too, all delivered in short order. So this is all wonderful for me, the consumer, though this customization is a big change to the customary make and full pallet quantities and ship full truckloads. This all adds another level of complexity. Not only do I want it now, but I want it special, special to me. So Mike, I'll start with you. Um, in past conversation with, with you, I know that you are certainly well versed in special to me all about the consumer's um, individual likes. So if you could speak on the operational changes and challenges for this type of distribution, um, I'll open it up to you, sure. Mike, and then we'll go to Rob and to Jason afterwards. That sounds good. Thanks, Vicki. Yeah, the, it, it's definitely a big change in, uh, in thinking and in processes, just uh, internally in how you want to uh, definitely run your operations and uh, adapt to the Internet of Things. Uh, Jason uh, touched on it as well. Uh, extremely important uh, from a technology standpoint when we look at the changes that we're needing internally within our operations to make sure that we're uh, servicing our customers. Um, we utilize Newlogy mm -hmm. technologies from the standpoint of uh, in all of our three operations. and. That technology is what is linking us uh, to our customers uh, every minute of the day. And I think that's where, you know, from the old kind of, let's just build a, a large quantity of an item and truckloads of that product uh, to get away from that and start to think of, hey, everything every day is going to be different and our customers uh, are going to adapt. It becomes even the most important is more important than ever to be 
working very closely with your customer. And that's what we've kind of done from our supply chain and our production side. We actually, I mean, if you were here in our operations listening to us, working with our customers, we are on the phone both from a supply chain and a production standpoint with a majority of our customers almost hourly on the way things have to change and adapt. And you truly need to become part of each other's businesses uh, to make it happen when you want to drive this, hey, it's for me, it was picked for me, it's the items I wanted, and I got them today. And uh, our people uh, adapt to changes uh, hourly. So in our production, uh, like Rob had mentioned earlier too, um, you know, we, we are changing our production plans almost on an hourly basis. And we can change items that we're running. We can switch back to products in case a customer is seeing things moving quicker. And we truly, we're picking thousands and thousands of orders every day that are going out to the people on this phone call uh, to ourselves that are basically designed to support uh, an e-commerce pick and pack system for our customers and get that product in the person's hands that they want to deliver it to. Okay, so I'm hearing uh, flexibility all over the place there. And collaborative connectivity. Um, I, it, it, it seems that this type of connectivity would really drive away from a transactional more to a strategic partnership with your customers. Um, can you speak to the relationship changes with your client base? giving this uh, changing e-commerce world? The, you know, uh, what's happened, Vicki, is that um, we've, really, we've really become, from a relationship, really become part of each other's businesses. I mean, we, we have customers in here almost every day, right, working on new projects, uh, new changes, uh, brand, you know, changes to the product lines. Um, even focusing on, you know, regional products that, uh, you know, they just want to focus maybe in Northern California or they, they want to focus in the, uh, you know, Texas region, that type of stuff. And it's, it's, it's truly a link between our two companies. And again, technology, like from Newlogy, uh, is allowing us to uh, create that stronger relationship with our customer. Interesting. Thank you, Mike. Rob, would you like to take it from here? Well, I definitely would uh, agree with the, with Mike, and I'd want to stress the communication um, aspect of it. Um, and it's really three-way communication. The, the communication on the back end that we have to have with our customers, the, the product uh, group um, is key to making sure that we're keeping up with the times and keeping up with their, their needs. But it's also that communication that they're giving to their customer um, that's saying this is just for you. This is communicating your special. And um, a lot of that is done through the packaging, through the digital print, and, and being able to, to communicate to that, to that end use customer. And with that, the, the benefit to the brands is they're not having as much price pressure put on them because now they're doing something that is, is solely for that customer. So they're not having the price wars and things of that nature when they use this type of format. So that seems to be the benefit on their side. Interesting. Jason, anything to add? Um, I, uh, I would, I would, uh, I, I only, I build on the fact that uh, this mass customization uh, in this me economy, uh, it's, it, 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 I visualize it like uh, everyone, everyone's a snowflake, right? And um, to, to deliver that on that snowflake, um, uh, the holy grail is to deliver that perfect order, the right time, the right product, the right price, and, and, and so forth. And that requires the, uh, which Rob and Mike uh, certainly alluded to and, and spoke about, is the transparency uh, and collaboration with uh, uh, the customer uh, to be able to uh, deliver on a consumer order with the speed, flexibility, and agility. That's, that's the name of the game. Um, to do so, 
uh, uh, as a technologist, it's not it's not necessarily what you what you build, but it's what you can pull on and what you can arrange and compon componentize within your service offerings to to your customers to launch uh, those new services that give them the flexibility to their consumer. Um, and uh, that is in, uh, that's not going to change. <laughs> um, there's going to be um, an acceleration, I, I think, in that in that area, and it's a it's a incredible opportunity to build relationships and even what we've seen is uh, some some co-packers and co-manufacturers um, uh, work more upstream with with their with their with their brand customers to launch those products so well thanks again that's, Jason yeah. that's great that's also a great lead in to our next trend that we'll talk about here and that's you know certainly speed to market um, so we've talked about uh, me, the average consumer now, buying things via the internet and having them customized to me, but add to that the increasing demand for immediate availability and delivery, both of which contribute to shorter product life cycles and a proliferation of SKUs and a compressed timeline. It seems all of this change in such short order might be putting companies at a higher risk for a variety of issues. Um, so I'll start with you, Jason. When you hear fresher, better, faster, what does that mean in your world? Uh, it reminds me of the Olympics, uh, you know, stronger, <laughs> higher. That is, that is um, uh, with uh, uh, products that can go uh, become obsolete, uh, I, I know that um, uh, some of the uh, more stringent supply chains uh, that uh, even Mike and Rob um, serve on the on the food and beverage, and you know, we, work, we work with in the pharmaceuticals uh, area. Um, it's uh, the obsolescence of the product is, is extremely costly. So uh, getting products to market faster um, and at the right quantity, uh, because the short the, the lifespans are so much shorter, um, uh, that really really matters. Uh, that really matters to the to, to the to the brand, and hence the the shorter uh, run, um, the runner production runs, and uh, technology uh, re uh, enables the elimination uh, in that perfect order of the bullwhip effect, um, so that the uh, communication signal, um, ideally right from order right through through uh, uh, from from production delivery, is is the same. Um, and uh, you can get a get a pull supply chain um, in effect there, uh, run pushing products. So uh, this is this is a um, uh, a concept that has been uh, you know, around, but I think the uh, co packers and co manufacturers are playing a more critical role because brands are relying on them to bring the solution uh, and and uh, and own more of that uh, process. Interesting. All right, um, uh, Rob. Um, when you hear "fresher, better, faster," um, you know, um, in addition to sleepless nights, what can you add to this conversation? <laughs> yes, it's, it, it's definitely it uh, creates a challenge. Not only are are they looking for fresher and faster, but they're also looking for healthier and no preservatives and clean label and uh, and all of these other things that in a perfect world in nirvana you can put them all together and they match but it's very difficult to to seize on each of these points and and bring them and put them together um, we're doing a lot of things in terms of uh, r d and 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 uh, back-end development to look at how we can process food uh, faster how we can use less energy how we can make these changes faster than the current processing technologies just so that we can keep up with what's what's being in place. Um, the other issue is the the uh, shelf life on of the product in the stores and being able to keep that freshness um, for longer periods of time to avoid that obsolescence that Jason was talking about. So it all creates um, immense challenges, but it also you know creates a much stronger supply chain. That's great. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I just to add a couple more things. I think the when I when I hear uh, fresher, better, and faster, it definitely comes down to uh, to communication with our customers. Um, the the key concern that both Rob and 
Jason touched on, the, the obsolescence and the management of inventories uh, become very critical. And to me, that's where the communication is uh, of utmost importance uh, between us and our customer and managing uh, the effects of that. So definitely, uh, definitely inventory and communication, two key things. Well, my next question is, um, many consumer packaged goods companies have manufacturing facilities as well, and this conversation is certainly not foreign. Um, what gives contract packagers the upper hand as it relates to speed to market in those challenges we just talked about? I'll start with you, Mike. You know what, uh, Vicki, I think the, uh, the, the big advantages that we have, uh, again, are that we we as contract packagers have been used to being a little more uh, flexible and nimble in the handling of products and, and customers. And um, CPGs are very good, obviously focused at doing big things very well, but you know, to change and adapt, um, you're turning big ships in order to address um, the changes uh, in, in technology and the internet. And that's where I think the contract packagers come into play is that as things are changing so rapidly, we are able to help CPGs adapt to uh, the new product launches, the new product investigations. We can do things regionally. Um, the CPA, the Contract Packaging Association, right with the links of its membership, are able to service customers nationally uh, if needed on certain aspects. And that's uh, one thing that we have done that to me is a big advantage is we have linked with other membership uh, members across the country to service a single customer. And I think those types of things, you know, in our industry uh, definitely help us to help the CPGs get their products right in the right hands of the people that need it. And uh, to me, the that that membership is a is a huge advantage uh, to uh, to the contract packaging industry. Anything to add, Rob? Yeah, I, I agree. The the collaboration is 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 key, um, and uh, being a member of the industry for a while, um, you 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 can feel comfortable uh, recommending uh, different members. To, to your clients um, for the services that they require. And uh, if you're not able to supply them with that product, it's okay. You're still helping them. You're still uh, putting them together with a quality supplier. And so you're, you're creating your value there. Um, and you know, as far as um, contract packagers versus the, the uh, CPG group, you know, a contract packager is by nature nimble um, forced to be able to adapt and to be able to change up product lines on the fly because that's their business. That's what they do. And I would argue that um, you know CPG companies wouldn't be as successful as they are today if it wasn't for contract packagers. Okay, thank you. All right. So so in this last bit, we've talked about talent and technology and serving nationally. Well, that really takes us into the next trend, and that is globalization, partnering together around the globe, one world, one partner concept. So the world is shrinking. Companies are looking today at where their strategic co-packers and co-manufacturers are and where they'd like them to be around the globe. Um, so panelists, um, can you share with us, have you branched out globally to serve a customer? And if so, what can you share with the audience? Let's start with, um, with Rob. Um, we've, uh, we've worked with uh, folks such as Nestle in, in, in uh, Europe at headquarters there, as well as Nestle here in, in the U.S. And um, one of the... Uh, one of the instances that we had, not with Nestle, but a different customer, is they, they were a large um, frozen uh, pet food company in Europe, and they were deciding to uh, establish a market hold in, in the U.S. And um, through the U.K. Uh, Contract Packaging Association, who I had reached out to when I was in, in the U.K., um, they actually contacted us 
because they had our information from the UK Contract Packaging Association. So as we work closer and closer with uh, member associations like that, I think you'll see much more of this uh, developing over time. Okay, thank you. Mike, anything to share? Sure. Uh, we definitely, uh, Vicki, we, we have a number of customers who are uh, from Europe, as far as headquartered in Europe and or Asia, where we are supporting uh, products of theirs for distribution here in the U.S. Um, one of the big advantages that that gives us is being here on the West Coast, um, we, you know, we're, we are close proximity to all the ports. So whether it's, uh, you know, food products coming from Asia, South America, wherever they may be coming from, um, we definitely have the opportunity and have linked with these, uh, these customers from uh, overseas. Uh, we are also, on the reverse, we have a number of customers that we work with uh, as well um, that are producing products here with ingredients from the U.S. and doing distribution to, to Asia and Europe uh, with their product lines from our locations uh, here on the West Coast. So, yes, we have definitely uh, gone after uh, global opportunities. And, and is that new for you in the last, say, five years? Yes, that would definitely be new for us in the last five years. Okay. And again, the the in, the internet of things, you know, is helping to drive that activity. Interesting. And Jason, your company is a globally um, a global company. Would you like to add on to this conversation as well? Uh, yes, I, I think um, uh, everyone, whether they, they say it or not, wants to go global. I think that that. Uh, and if you're if you're not, then I'm not I'm not sure. I, I think the the reach um, right now through the Internet of Things uh, and uh, you can get um, into new markets is tremendous. Uh, the challenge, obviously, uh, to fulfill that desire to go global and to break into those new markets is how do I ensure consistent standard uh, and quality and process um, with also addressing the unique 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 needs of that. Specific market. So, what we see uh, with uh, with a, a lot of our um, uh, customers that uh, through technology have been enabled to break into those new markets, they can assure their brand customers that consistency, that transparency, that compliance, that that quality, while while getting the speed um, uh, into that new region with. Um, with uh, with the assuredness and, and guarantee of outcome um, that 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 lives up to the same standard uh, in, in in maybe a, a, a home region or a home home uh, home area, so I think that uh, 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 the reach is there. Uh, how do you how do you get to it? And I think it's more um, accessible uh, from local players to do. All right. Well, thank you. Well, I'm being told that we have some questions, and we want to leave time here for for our audience to ask some questions to our panelists. So I'm going to um, turn it back over to Jim, who will facilitate the Q&A. Okay. Thank you, Vicki, and thank you, panelists. And uh, apologize again for the uh, the audio difficulty at the beginning, but uh, I, I think. It went pretty smoothly uh, once we got everybody on the line. So um, again, uh, please do type the, uh, your, any questions you have in the questions field on your screen, and uh, we will get to them as quickly as possible. So uh, one question uh, that, that uh, I'd like to throw out there is, um, you talked about, uh, I, I think maybe it was Jason that talked about uh, speed uh, to market is uh, the only sustainable advantage. Uh, Jason, can you or the other panels talk about, uh, is there ever a time in contract packaging when, when speed could be uh, a bad thing, too much speed? Could you talk about that a little bit? Um. Do you, I can, I can, or Mike, do you want, or Rob, do you want to take it first? Uh, 
Sure. Yeah, this is Rob. I'll, I'll take it. Um, yeah, you have to be disciplined in, in, in uh, what you're doing, and, and um, you can't let speed to market to have you, cause you to shortcut any of the necessary steps that you need, need to make. And um, one of the products that, that we can make is a, a shelf-stable baby food. Well, you're putting a baby food out there uh, in the marketplace, and you better make sure you've got all your processing parameters and all of your ducks in a row before that product gets onto that store shelf. So the only caution I would give on, on the, the speed to market and moving too fast is uh, just making sure that as you're doing it, you're, you're checking off uh, all, of the, all of the key uh, components and, and everything you need to do for food and product safety. Yeah, Jim, Jim, this is Mike. I, I would definitely agree with Rob uh, that you definitely need to make sure you're not missing things as you go through it. We, uh, we actually work with checklists internally here to make sure that from a speed standpoint that we, we are not missing things, you know, when we're doing new product introductions uh, with our customers. And, you know, the uh, Food Safety Modernization Act, FISMA, is driving a lot of that as well from the standpoint of expectations if you're in the food industry of the quality and the performance of suppliers where ingredients are coming from uh, definitely uh, becoming more and more important every year as we go forward so you definitely have to make sure that you're you're checking along the way yeah. uh, speed uh Speed kills, right? We're, we all grew up to hear about speed killing, and it's 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 good and bad. It'll, it'll it can kill competition, but it also kills you if you if, you, if it's, it's it's mismanaged and you're not able able to be um, disciplined and, and also responsive. From a from a systems perspective, um, we we roll out updates to um, to for example with with, with Mike equipping uh, his operations um, uh, on a, on a weekly basis. So being able to adopt uh, new technology, so not just driving new things, but being able to pull uh, and adopt new workflows. Uh, so it's the obsolescence of, of a permanent enterprise platform and the evolution to a heterogeneous distributed system that's continuously evolving. And that evolution um, is, is uh, and responsiveness, I think, for the, is going to be important for the ones who win in the future. OK, thank you. Uh, a follow-up question on speed to market. How has packaging changed as speed to market has gained traction? Cold packs are massive. Is that a problem politically possibly going forward in the future? Uh, this is Rob. I'm not sure about the, the, the part about the cold packs uh, being large, um, but, I, but I can't say that uh, it, you know, as far as packaging is concerned, it, it does become very challenging um, as you condense lead times and, and uh, trying to, to push everything through. Um, it, can, it can really stress um, the production environment in, in printing. Um, a lot of times rushing through on print jobs, that's when mistakes happen. That's when you have the, the, you know, the characters missing or whatever it may be that that's an issue. So. Um, I think it's just kind of reiterating what I mentioned in my last statement um, and addressing it to packaging. It's, it's just as important or even more important to make sure you're checking off the list and, and got everything right before, before you get to production and go. Hey, any, any other thoughts on that? Okay, well hearing none, let's move on to another question. Um, the three of you talk quite a bit about, uh, in one form or another, about e-commerce. Um, given the need to be fast and to be flexible and and to uh, uh, be able to uh, change on a dime, so to speak, uh, if, if there was one question that you think uh, potential users of your service uh, should be asking uh, contract packaging uh, as it relates to e-commerce and packaging, what would it be? This is this is uh this is Mike Jim. Um, I would say you know, the the one question I would be asking would be uh, show me show me your systems, 
show me your communication systems and processes internally for managing e-commerce from my customers' orders to the fulfillment. That would be, I know it's a long question, but it's, that's my one question. And this is Rob. I, I, I would definitely echo that. Okay. Anything further there? All right. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, I think you, you touched on it a little bit during the presentation. Uh, you talked about uh, strategic, and I'm not sure if, if tactical was also used in there in terms of uh, uses for contract packaging. Um, Rob, I'll start with you. Uh, is there any trend that you're seeing toward more strategic use of contract packaging services uh, versus a tactical? And, and could you give uh, a brief example of, of both uses? Well, uh, the, the strategic um, I think there's, uh, it depends on the, the end use customer. I think with the, the CPGs and the multinationals, strategic is uh, much more of uh, a big part of, of what they're looking at doing. And I think Jason can probably talk more to this too. Um, but the, they, they, they want uh, the least amount of noise in the manufacturing process and their supply chain. So if you keep the noise out, that means everything's running smooth. And for them to be able to do that, they look at those partners that can provide all of the services that they need or multiple products so that they, can, they know they can rely on that partner to produce X amount of different products for them. And they'll continue to, to feed them as long as that partner performs um, in a strategic way. I think you get more tactical when you're looking at the smaller companies that are looking at doing uh, contract manufacturing and starting a new product or doing this or that, that would be a, a tactical tactical uh, situation there. I think that's kind of how I would break them apart. Okay. Um, I think we got time for, for one more question here. Um, again, I think maybe we, we hit on this from time to time over the hour, but uh, when we talk about the make versus buy decision, is there anything uh, that uh, has changed over the last year or two that uh, CPG companies on the line would need to know uh, in, in making the make versus buy that determination? Anything trending there? I would, I would say like, the... Go ahead, Jason. Uh, I will. I will get one of the topics is, is, is speed. What can I get uh, fast to market to test and prototype first? Um, is uh, is it something that is, is is a new new product entry altogether? Um, is it a new you know doing the same thing uh, in a new geography, which is totally different from creating a category of product, uh, maybe in a current uh, geography or demographic. So um, those are considerations. So if I can get to market faster and, and create a new product category with a strategic partner, that's highly valuable. Might uh, and especially if I can get some shared resources off that and experience that is from that um, that strategic supplier. So um, those are all um, considerations for when to when to buy it out outsource it. Hey, Mike, you're up. Jim, I would say, uh, this is Mike, I would say uh, one of the things that I think the CPGs that are on the phone should know is that, uh, you know, in the last two years, uh, the contract packaging industry and the contract packagers out there have definitely made uh, huge strides forward in building capabilities and becoming that, uh, you know, end-to-end -end resource for uh, for producing products, and I think um, based on food safety and all the regulations and the expectations that are out there, uh, I think that if you haven't talked to a contract packager in the last few years, uh, you should definitely start talking to them because you'll find that the advances made in our industry are huge. 
So I would, I would uh, challenge people to contact okay. people. Okay. Uh, uh, great information, panelists. And uh, I, I want to close the hour with one question uh, I'll pose to Vicki as president of the CPA. Uh, uh, where, where can people go to get a directory of contract packagers and, and engage with them? There is a directory that's open to anyone, to the public, and it is on the Contract Packaging Association website, listed on the screen here, www.contractpackaging.org. Uh, you can sort by locale, you can sort by company name, um, our associate members are part of that sort criteria. Um, there is also a request for bid um, area and you can list a project or a question and it would go out to all of our members. So you can be sure to uh, receive back some good feedback in your inbox um, from utilizing that tool. Okay. Great, uh, great options there and, and thank you very much panelists, uh, Rob and Mike and Jason. Uh, tremendous information and I think it'll be very valuable to those on the line and, and those who will access this information afterwards. Uh, Vicki, I thank you for moderating. Great job. And uh, just a quick housekeeping note, uh, this webinar was recorded, so the, uh, the recording will be available afterwards. Uh, for CPA members, it'll be on uh, contractpackaging.org. For IOPP members, uh, if, if uh, you get the webinar on demand benefit, uh, you'll be able to access this off of IOPP.org. So this uh, concludes our webinar. And um, we do have another webinar uh, at IOPP coming up in two weeks from today, actually, uh, January 31st at 10 a.m. Central. Dr. Johannes Bergmayer. Vice President of Sustainability and Food Safety at the World Packaging Organization will be presenting on food losses and food waste, the role of packaging. So look for your uh, details in your inbox if you haven't seen it already or check back on IOPP.org. And certainly everybody on the line, the line, we encourage you to attend. So once again, thanks for attending today's webinar presentation and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.